Good morning. It's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Although this morning we're going to be worshiping with our friends at the First Presbyterian Church of Maywood uh, together. So that'll be fun. At Elmwood Park, we're right in the middle of a series on something in our Presbyterian Book of Order called The Six Great Ends of the Church. So far, we've done the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind and the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God. And these sermons stand alone, so I'm going to continue this week with the maintenance of divine worship. To do that, I want to mention Karl Barth. Now, you've probably never heard of him. He never achieved a lot of name recognition with the public, and he had his decades in the past. But he's considered by many to have been the most important theologian of the 20th century. Barth was born in the 19th century when it was assumed that we human beings could bring in the kingdom of God through education, civility, and creating a moral society. That particular theology crashed and burned on the bloody battlefields of World War I, when the most enlightened Christian countries in the world massacred an entire generation. In 1919, Barth published his commentary on Romans, in which he stated the simple truth that when Paul said everyone was a sinner in need of a savior, He wasn't kidding, and that no amount of education or civilization would change that. And all through the rise and fall of Nazism, Christian preachers around the world waited with bated breath for Bart's latest book so they would know what to preach. I'd love to go on and on about this great theologian, but actually I just brought him up so I could talk about his painting. Because for all the thousands of pages this man wrote, he always had one painting prominently displayed in his study. In the painting was John the Baptist holding a Bible, pointing at Jesus on the cross. And to me, that is the essence of divine worship. And that is what shaped and changed Karl Barth to write the things that he wrote in service to the church, just as the way we worship shapes and forms us as Christians. And like Barth's painting, everything about our worship ought to point to Jesus as the Son of God, and to the Father, and to the Holy Spirit. And it ought not to point to anything else at all. That sounds simple enough, but it never is. Otherwise, why would God have made, you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make for yourself an idol, is the first and second of the Ten Commandments. And why else would Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Be the first and the greatest commandment, the summation of the other ten. The reason is because it is so easy for us to love other gods of our own making instead of the one true Lord. The first way this happens is that we get so involved in other things that we forget to worship. I do not have anyone in particular in mind, but in the scattered churches of the world, some are not worshiping this morning because they are still worshiping their pillow or because they were worshiping a bottle last night. And going right along with that, but even more insidious, is the fact that we sometimes forget what it is that we do in churches. I remember visiting a cousin some time ago and watched with fascination as she tried to manipulate her children into going to church. Someone has to bring your grandfather, she would say. Then someone has to bring him home. And as long as you're there, you might as well go to church. Nowhere in the conversation did the word God or worship enter into things. The whole focus was just on going to church. Even if she succeeds in getting them to go to church, will they ever go after she is out of the picture someday? Not unless some dramatic change occurs not unless they get in touch with what worship is. Worship is following John the Baptist's finger, or my finger for that matter, because the focus should never rest on me or any preacher. Rather, I, like John, had better be holding the Bible in one hand and pointing at the cross of Christ with the other. In fact, I sincerely hope that no one either comes to worship because of me or stays away from worship because of me because I'm not what this is about any more than 
church buildings or institutions are. Divine worship must always be focused on the divine, on God. Neither I nor any other minister ought to be thought of as a performer with you as the audience. Indeed, I'm more like a conductor and you the players with our liturgists and choirs and accompanists playing special roles and God is our audience. Okay, there's no doubt that we receive something in worship, and we certainly hope to leave refreshed and challenged. But we are really here to give ourselves in worship. Not only do we make an offering to God, not only do we offer prayers to God, but we come to offer ourselves to God. And why do we do that? Because God is worthy. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the only thing worthy of worship in the entire universe. Things of the natural world are not worthy of worship, no matter how beautiful or majestic. Yes, one may feel inspired by nature and admire it, but worshiping nature is pointless. There is nothing but stone and wood and wind. But nature points to God as the splendor of creation leads us to consider and worship the Creator. As God says in Romans 1, ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things that he has made. And just as things that are made by human hands, as far as things that are made by human hands, worshiping them is truly pointless. Isaiah 44 speaks of this mockingly. It speaks of the carpenter who cuts down a tree and shapes the wood into a statue of a man and sets it in a shrine. How silly then to bow down and worship the thing one has had a hand in making. One may appreciate a work of art or be proud of some craft we have made or feel a sentimental attachment to a building or be a fan uh, of a sports figure or entertainer. No one and one may feel loyalty to a congregation or a company or a nation, but no one should ever worship such things. For to worship them would be to demean God, to demote God, to disbelieve in the reality of God. Yes, there's two approaches to idols. We've spoken of the first and more pathetic of the two, which is to expect an idol to accomplish something for you. But there is a much sadder form of idolatry, and that is to lower God to the status of a mere idol. From such a viewpoint, you don't expect the idol to have any power, and you don't expect God to have any power either. To worship when you don't expect the living God to be active and powerful and full of passionate love is, an is a meaningless habit or ritual. Jeremiah 16 says this about idols. O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in time of distress, to you the nations will come from the ends of the earth and say, our fathers possessed nothing but false gods, worthless idols that did them no good. Do people make their own gods? Yes, but they are not gods. And God replies in the prophecy, I will teach them. This time I will teach them my power and might. And then they will know that my name is the, the Lord. And Hebrews 4 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to a dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, my friends, we speak of a God who is worthy of worship. And let us not forget the glory of Christ as recorded in Colossians 1. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. 
My friends, this is the good news. Our God who loves us so much constantly reaches out to us. Our attention is directed to God when we look at the beauty of nature. Our salvation is promised in Christ and our life is enriched by the Holy Spirit. Our primary response is to go and engage in the service of worship, where we are doing service to our God through our worship. God is the focus and the audience. We are the worshipers. Thus, every week we maintain divine worship for how amazing is our God. Cannot we join with Mary as she worships? My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Why do we worship? Because God is worthy of worship and because God is living and active in our lives. Amen, my friends. God bless.